Wow, what a wonderful thing to see what God is doing. And again, to be here tonight, and we're going to see fireworks tonight. So let's get into the Word of God. We're going to be in Luke chapter 11 this evening. I want to talk to you about walking with God. I want to talk to you about having a relationship with God. You know, you can't have a relationship with God. You can't walk with God. You can't, he's not going to work in our lives until we're honest with God him unless we are totally and completely honest with god uh several years ago let me start back one more story my my son joshua is uh uh my son joshua when he was 18 months old went we had to rush him to the hospital because he was dying his body was shriveling up we did not understand what was going on we were new parents uh, uh matthew was very healthy but Joshua was was just he was shriveling up his he was getting so skinny we were young in ministry our church was only about four years old uh, and uh, we didn't have any uh, health insurance we had nothing so we it, it was it was just getting desperate we went down to the county hospital and said we've got to do something about this we happened to know a doctor who cared enough about us to say hey we'll we, we will help and we'll not charge you anything dr hulse took a look at him and said i'm going to examine him and examine him and he said listen here's the problem this boy has a major allergy to milk and to sugar and he what he what you're doing is you're feeding him these things that have got milk and sugar in them and it's just drying him up and he's about he, he will die if you don't get him off that so we got very 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 serious about getting him off of milk and sugar so that he would be able to survive and he came back and uh, man we were very very strict about that very very careful about never allowing him to have milk and sugar now if if some parent ever tells you my child sunday school teachers listen to me uh awana workers if you have awana workers or you no know, if you're working with children and a parent says my child's allergic to milk and sugar believe them uh don't be the nice uh, uh sunday school teacher that sneaks him a piece of candy or or, or some uh, milk uh, we would have so many kind um kind sunday school workers and awana workers and children's workers who would help them him out uh, because of his terrible parents who were withholding this stuff from him and then he would come home and get sick and we would say hey, what what's going on one day i came downstairs now we we had in our house we we uh, we realized that he couldn't have milk he couldn't have sugar uh, and so uh, but, but but we didn't take that out of our house we knew that he was going to have to grow up two reasons we didn't take milk and sugar out of, of our house was because we we knew he was going to have to grow up and people all around him were going to be eating ice cream. People all around him were, were going to be eating cake. All, all that stuff was going to go on. And he was going to have to learn to live with that limitation in his life. That was the first reason. Second reason is, I like ice cream. And, uh, and so we, we had that in our house. And so, so, but he wasn't allowed to have it. We'd always substitute whatever he needed. Uh, we'd always substitute with something that he could have. And uh, so... So, uh, but we had ice cream in our, in our freezer. One morning, I came walking downstairs, walked out into our little kitchen area, and in the middle of our kitchen area, now, now when Joshua would eat ice cream, whenever he would eat uh, uh, sugar, uh, whenever he would have uh, milk or sugar products, he would get su sick to his stomach, terribly, terribly sick to his stomach. Pain, cramps in his stomach. So I walked downstairs. I, it, it, it was early in the morning. I'm always up earlier than anybody else. Right out in the middle of the kitchen floor, there is a carton of ice cream that is opened up. The lid is off of the ice cream. There's a, there's a spoon inside the ice cream, and the ice cream is melting out the bottom of the ice cream container. And I thought, oh, something's happened here. I yell upstairs. I said, Matt... Josh, Charity, come down here. They're the three oldest. My daughters are Charity, Faith, and Hope. That we have the fruit of the Spirit in our house. And so we had, uh, I, had I said, Matt, Josh, Charity, come down here. Uh, they all came down, uh, and I, I said, look at this. And they're all standing, looking. I said, I want to know which one of you did this. I looked at Matthew. I said, Matthew, did you do this? Matthew said, No. I said, Charity, did you do this? And she said, 
no, I didn't do this. I looked at Joshua, who was going, oh. I said, Joshua, did you do this? He said, yes. I said, Joshua, why did you do this? You knew <clears throat> if you did this, you were going to get sick to your stomach. And you also know what else is going to happen. What's going to happen? I'm going to get a snake. I said, that's right. <clears throat> you did this, and you knew you were going to get sick. You knew that I'm going to have to spank you. Now, why did you do that? Why did you do that? He said, well, Dad, he said, I thought about the ice cream. When I came downstairs thinking about the ice cream, and I got the ice cream. And I thought about the spanking. And then I thought about the ice cream. <laughs> and then I thought about the spanking. And I thought about the ice cream. And I thought about the spanking. And I thought it's worth it. <laughs> you know, he just poured his heart out and he was crying. I don't believe that day that I spanked him. I think I took him up and I loved him because he got totally and completely open and honest with me. And we sat and talked about the fact that some children can eat this and some children can. And that's the way it is in life. And we were able to have an open, honest talk. And we walked together and loved one another. <clears throat> he learned a lesson. But I want you to understand this. God wants us to walk with him. And we can't walk with him unless we are honest with him. Unless we choose to get totally and completely honest before God. God wants us as individuals and as a church, God wants Valley Forge Baptist to know his power and his presence and his might and God wants to use this church to impact this community and continue to impact the world. But in order for that to happen, we have got to learn how to walk with God. In, in, in Luke chapter 11, the disciples come to Jesus. Now, they have been out, in, in, in Luke chapter 10, they've been out traveling. They have seen the power of God Seventy of them were sent out to preach the gospel two by two. And they saw God work in miraculous way. They saw demons cast out. They saw great things happen. They are now back with the Lord Jesus. And God is working in their midst. And they're seeing Jesus. Jesus goes away. He spends some time praying. And when he's finished praying, the Bible says the disciples came to Jesus. Look at this in verse uh, 1 of Luke chapter 11. The Bible says, And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, <clears throat> teach us to pray. As John also taught his disciples. Now note this. They have been doing miraculous work in the power of God. They've, been, they've seen God move in a wonderful way in and through their lives. But they're not satisfied. They want more of God to be, to be glorified through them. They want to see God answer their prayers the way God answered the prayers of the Lord Jesus. So they go to Jesus and say, we want to learn how to pray. Would you teach us to pray the way, the way John taught his disciples to pray? Now from verse 2 all the way through verse 13, Jesus teaches them, answers their request. You want to learn how to pray? Here's how to pray, and here's what to pray for. And I want you to see what he says here, because it's so, so important for us. Now, listen, I want you to know something. I'm not going to teach you theory today. I'm going to tell you that I do this every single 
day of my life. I find time every single day to do what I'm going to tell you to do. And I'm going to tell you this, that if you'll do what God tells you to do, you will see him move in your life. You'll walk with God and people will be influenced by you. You will see people, uh, uh, you'll have opportunities to share the gospel if you'll do what Jesus said. Jesus is going to teach them how to pray. Father, I pray that you'll help us as we look at this passage to learn what you said about prayer. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple of things I want you to see from verse 1. The Bible says it came to pass in a certain place when he was, uh, that he, when, when he was praying in a certain place. Number one, I want you to see this, that Jesus prayed in a certain place. There should be a place in your home. There should be a place where you go that you spend time with God. Now, people will say this. They'll say, Pastor, you don't understand. I pray all the time. I believe that we should be ever in prayer. I do too. I think if somebody comes up to you and says, hey, would you pray about something? You ought to pray for it right then. I think that there are, there are certain things. I'm driving down the road. My wife will say to me, the other day we were driving, we were driving out here. And I, we found out that my son was, was broken down in Albuquerque. And my, my, uh, my wife said, would you pray for, for Matt and Brianna and the kids? And so right then, I'm driving down the road. I said, Lord, I pray for Matt and Brianna. I pray you'll protect them, keep them safe. You know it's dark where they are. We, I just pray you'll protect them. I did not shut my eyes. I was driving and I asked God to do that. God hears and answers prayer. And we can pray any time. But, but there should be a time in your life, that there should be a place in your life where you go on a daily basis and you get alone with God. Uh, you can, you, uh, in my home, if my wife wakes up and it's between five o'clock and six o'clock in the morning, she, get, she'll wake up and sh- I'm not in the bed, she'll know exactly where to go to find me. There's a place in my home that I pray. When I go, when I'm traveling now, when I go to a motel room, I, before I get to, when I get in that motel room, uh, I, will, I will look for the place I'm going to pray the next morning. I want to make sure that when I wake up in the morning, when I'm tired, my body doesn't want to get up, I'm going to know there's a place for me to pray. The Bible says that he was in a certain place. Secondly, the Bible says, and when he was seized, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples to pray. And the Bible says, and he said unto them, when you pray. Second thing I want you to circle, or if if you circle things in your Bibles, the second thing you need to focus on is this, that Jesus said, when you pray. There should not only be a where, there should be a when. When do you pray? You will not be successful at anything in your life unless you schedule it into your life. And there's nothing more important nor more powerful in your life than this thing about prayer. There should be a when. Years ago, uh, one of my mentors, a man named Dan Mitchell, said to me, he said, uh, he said, Dave, you need to, if you're going to be used of God, you need to get up early in the morning. And I said, what's early? He said, five o'clock. I said, get up at five o'clock. Are you kidding? I have a hard time getting up by seven. He said, if you want to be used of God, you need to get up early. I said, I just, I have a hard time getting up. He said, Dave, if you want to get up, this is what I want you to do. He said, you can go home tonight, and you can say, when you, when, when, when you go to bed, you say, God, would you wake me up at 5 o'clock? You just go to bed praying, saying, God, wake me up at 5 o'clock, and I'll spend time with you. You do that, and he'll wake you up at 5 o'clock. I said, oh, that would work for anybody else, but this is Dave Tice, and uh, this body doesn't respond at 5 o'clock. And so uh, I, I went to bed, and I, and I thought about what he said, and I said, okay, God, now, I'm in a dorm with 24 guys. I have just a big open room with 24 guys. You don't put on an alarm clock at, at, at 5 o'clock in the morning when there's 24 guys because they will kill you. <laughs> so I said, okay, God, it's, uh, I'm going to bed right now. I really do want to spend time in prayer. And Dan Mitchell said I'm supposed to get up early in the morning and spend time with you. So God, wake me up. I'm asking you to wake me up at 5 o'clock in the morning. I went to sleep. Amazing thing happened. At 5 o'clock in the morning, my eyes popped open. I looked over at the clock that was next to my bed, and it was one of those illuminated, with illuminated uh, hands on it. I looked over it. It was 5 o'clock. I said, man, that's amazing. 
it works and I went back to sleep <laughs> but I learned something that day I, I, I learned you can ask God to do things and he'll do them for you if you really want to and I, I began to get up very early in the morning it's my practice to get up every morning between 5.30 and 6 o'clock and spend time with God I have a place that I go, I have a thing that I do in order to spend time with God. You need to, if you're going to be, if you're going to be effective in praying, you need to have a where, you need to have a when, because if you don't, then you won't pray. And you may not be an early morning riser, you may be a late night person. My wife stays up late and she prays at night, but there needs to be a where, there needs to be a when in your life and the Bible so the Bible says and he said unto him when you pray then he said this listen to this next word say the word say means to speak out loud well you say well can't doesn't God know the thoughts of my heart yeah God knows the thoughts of your heart but nobody else knows the thoughts of your heart and when you pray you need to understand you're entering into spiritual warfare can I tell you this, that God knows everything, so you can pray silently. I just told the Lord, I love him. But you didn't know that until I expressed it out loud. When you go alone in a room and shut the door behind you and you speak out loud, God will hear you, but not only will he hear you, the angels that are watching you will hear you. And they'll bring glory to God. And the demons that are, that are assigned to you will hear you as well. And you'll be entering into spiritual battle. Listen, let me explain to you. The story of Job is amazing. You know the story of Job. Job was, Satan said, can I attack that guy? God said, go ahead. You attack him. And the Bible tells us this, and we know this because we're watching it from from this historic perspective we know what took place the angels in heaven were watching him the demons of hell were watching him satan was watching him god was watching him job i don't believe he knew till after he went to heaven that he was on center stage in heaven and if he would have just bowed and said nothing just allowed himself to think to God and communicate to God, then the angels would never have heard. The demons would never have heard. There would have not been that spiritual victory, but when he said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord, the angels in heaven rejoiced and the demons cringed and Satan was upset. When we go before God, we need to speak out loud. We need to say out loud, but nobody else is around, no human beings. We, when we're speaking out loud, we're saying, we believe in the spiritual realm. We believe there's a God that's hearing us. And we're, we are making a statement by faith, saying we believe God. When you pray, where you pray, and when you pray, say, speak out loud, talk to God. I want you to understand too the idea of saying just means to speak out loud he doesn't say cry uh, there in, in in psalms the bible says my voice shall thou hear in the morning and evening and and morning and noon will i cry unto you the idea is constantly vocal prayers to god it's important that we pr when we pray that that we have a where that we have a when and that we pray out loud so the Bible says, Jesus said, when you pray, say. Now, I'm going to stop here for just a minute. And I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm, going to, I'm going to go away from prayer. Because the word prayer means to ask. Great old book, one of the great books that's ever been written on prayer. is written by a man named John R. Rice. The book was called Prayer, Asking, and Receiving. And he defines prayer biblically. That prayer means to ask. The word itself means to ask. God wants us daily to ask him for things. Why? Because it's, a, it's an action of faith and it shows our dependence upon him. And it brings glory to God when we ask him to do something. And when he answers it, it glorifies God. 
and he wants us to be he wants to be glorified so when you pray you should pray out loud you should ask god for things but i believe there's some things we ought to do to prepare our hearts to pray what are those things i i i i believe there's five things that every christian ought to do every single day let me give them to you very quickly number one every single day you ought to worship god Worship is not prayer. Prayer is asking God to do something. Worship. What is worship? You know, words mean things. In the Bible, now we, we use the word worship today as singing. People talk about lifting their eye, hands to the Lord. Uh, we talk about coming together in a worship service or in a worship center. We, we use the term in, in, a, in a different way than it's actually used in the Bible. In the Bible, the word worship always means to fall down before the idea of worship is this to bow before someone who is more is, is superior to you and say god i recognize that you are god you're the king of kings and the lord of lords and i am a servant i deserve nothing but hell you are holy you are just and you're good and i'm yours it's a bowing before him it is a position of servitude before one who is the master. Now, if you're physically unable to do that, I would suggest you sit down and bow your head before God. But if you can, I would, I would encourage you every single day to worship God. The Bible tells us when the, when the wise men came to Jesus, they bowed down and they worshiped him. In the book of Nehemiah, the Bible says when they, when they saw what God had done, they bowed and worshipped him. They put their face to the ground and they worshipped him. We worship him. It's amazing to me that millions upon millions of Muslims bow down three times a day before a false demonic God that they do not even understand and worship him and yet very few Christians practice bowing before God. You can bow. I actually don't bow because of the problem that, that, um, that uh, Lincoln talked about this morning. I often just fall down on my face and just say, Lord, I'm dirt. You are God. You are holy. Listen, you don't have to stay down there the whole time you're praying, but you ought to bow before God on a daily basis number one number two you ought to thank him the bible says we are to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and to his courts with praise in fact the bible says this that when we pray we should pray to him with thanksgiving god convicted me about this just within the last six months that i i pray for my grandchildren every day i pray that they'll serve the lord i pray that they'll stay pure I pray that, that for their spouse, that, they'll, 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 that, that God will give them a godly spouse. I pray those things. And, and, and then I was, I was praying one day, and I thought, and that I just think it was the Spirit of God said to me, why don't you thank me for what I have done? I've got five, you, you've got five wonderful uh, uh, children-in-laws. I mean, they are, I've got, I, all of my kids marry godly kids, and they're all serving Jesus. And I thought, man, what I need to do is as I'm praying for, for Ashlyn to, to have a godly husband, thank him that, that Matt gave, or that God gave Matt, Brianna, a, a godly wife. I, I need to thank God for what he has given me. And then, so when I ask him to do something, I should pray with thanksgiving. So, so thank him. Man, we have so much to be thankful for. Just the fact that you're in this beautiful facility. Uh, you say, well, we're not in our church building. Can I tell you there are churches across this country that would thank God for this. This would be the worship center of their dreams. And you're here in this place. You can thank God for that. Thank God for your pastor. Thank God for your pastor's wife. Thank God for, for a family that loves the Lord. Thank God for whatever you can. Thank God for. Thank him. Tell him how thankful you are. First of all, worship him. Secondly, thank him. Thirdly, praise him. What's the difference between thanking him and praising him? When I thank, I, I, when I come to Pastor Wendell, I say, thank you 
so much for allowing me to be here. Thank you. You took me out. We had salmon this afternoon. Thank you for that. And thank you. And if you ever want to do that again, I'll thank you again. <laughs> thank you for that. Thank you for how, being so gracious to us. Thank you for inviting us. That's, that's thank you. Praise is this. Man, you're a good-looking guy. <laughs> now I'm just sort of speaking off the cuff here, but... <laughs> You, you, man, you dress so sharp. I mean, you, you, it, the way you interact with people, you are just an amazing man. You, that's praise. Praise is telling him how wonderful he is. Man, we ought to tell God how wonderful he is. If you think we serve a wonderful God, say amen. amen. Yeah, we serve a wonderful God. You ought to tell him that. Now, if you're like me, you have a limited vocabulary. I, I don't, I, I can't, when I'm wanting to tell him how wonderful he is, I can't think of the right words. But that's why God gave us songwriters. So we can, so we can go to them and they've written words to us. Or words so that we can sing them to him. I, I sing to him. Almost every day, I sing, your name is wonderful. Your name is wonderful. Your name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. You are the mighty king. You're master of everything. Your name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord, you're the great shepherd, the rock of all ages. Almighty God are you. I bow down before you. I love and adore you. Your name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord, I sing that to him. He likes to hear that. He wants me to tell him how wonderful he is. You know what? I like it when my wife tells me I did a good job. I like it when my wife tells me you're handsome. I like it when she tells me you're the most masculine man I've ever met in my life. I, I like to hear praise from my wife. You know, God wants to hear you tell him how wonderful he is out loud so that the demons and the angels can hear you tell him how wonderful he is the word blessed when we when the bible says bless the lord O my soul that means to speak to other people about how wonderful he is to praise him is to tell him how wonderful you think he is you ought to worship him every day you ought to thank him every day you ought to praise him every day then you need to confess your sin to him every single day that's getting honest with god that's just getting honest with God. Saying, Lord, I just want you to know that uh, I, I'm selfish and self-centered. You say, well, I can't think of anything to confess. Just ask your wife. She'll give you a list of things you can confess. Confess your, your, your sin to him. Go to God and say, God, listen, you know what? I have a divisive spirit. You know, God, I, I have a competitive spirit. God, when somebody else is getting praised, I want that praise. I confess that to you. God, I confess to you, I am selfish and self-centered. I realize that. I am so selfish. You know what I want when I come home? When my children were at home, this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to come home, open the door, and have them come and say, Father, <laughs> Father, oh, it's so good to have you. Come in, Father. Come, sit in your recliner. Sit Here's the remote. Watch what you want to watch because you've worked all day long and you're tired. Let me take off your shoes. Relax, Father. Can we get you something to drink? I want my wife to walk and come up and say, Honey, I'm so glad you're home. Let me hold you. Yes, dear. I, th that's what I want. You say, Why do you want that? Because I'm selfish. I'm self-centered. I want them to appreciate me. I am by nature a selfish, self-centered person. And I've come to that realization, and you need to too. You need to confess your sin to him. I, don't, I think daily I say to him, Lord, I'm so selfish, I'm so self-centered, I'm so, God, I, I need you to control me because I confess to you those things. We can get so petty and we can be so condemning and we can be so critical and God, I want you, I want to confess those things to you. So we, we worship him, we praise him, we thank him, we confess our sin to you. And then here's something that I think is amazing. 
You need to say, I love you to Jesus every day. Tell him, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Heavenly Father, I love you. Holy Spirit, I love you. Tell him you love him. Does he care about that? Oh, let me tell you a story. Jesus, Jesus had a disciple named Peter. You remember him? Peter uh, said to Jesus, Jesus, I'll go and die with you. I'm, I'm ready to die with you. And Jesus looked at him and said, Peter, you're going to die with me? No, Peter. Before the cock crows, you can check this out in John 13, he says, you're going to deny me three times. But don't let your heart be troubled, he says in John 14, 1. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Peter was grieved in his heart that Jesus thought that, that, that Jesus thought he would deny him, but then Peter did. He denied him three times. Look, treat me bad once, and I'm going to have a hard time with you. Treat me bad twice, I'm just going to avoid you. Treat me bad three times, I'm going to do everything I can to ignore you, stay away from you. I don't care what you think about me anymore. I've already hardened my heart to you. I don't care. I can cut you off. Peter denied Jesus three times. It wasn't but a few days later, Jesus met Peter at Galilee. And he said, Peter, I want to ask you a question. And he didn't say, why did you deny me? What kind of rat are you? I thought you were my friend. Man, I can't believe you. You're that most hard-headed, pig-headed, stubborn, mulish guy. He didn't say any of that. He said, Peter, I have a question. I can imagine Peter's thinking, what's he going to say? And he said, Peter, I just want to know something. He wanted to know this. He said, Peter, do you love me? Man, why would he care? Peter denied him three times. He said, Peter, do you love me? Peter said, and he used the word agape, which meant unconditional love. Peter said, you know I love you with emotion. I love you as a friend. I love you. you and I really believe Peter was thinking this. This is a more total speculation. He knows I don't love him unconditionally. I denied him, but I want to tell him that I have great affection for him. He said, Peter, do you love me? He said, Peter, do you love me? Three times he said, Peter, do you love me? I've often wondered why God would care if a worm like Dave Tice said, I love you. Why in the world would he want this worm to say, I love you? I don't know why, but he wants to hear me say, I love you. And if my master wants me to say, I love you, I'm going to say, Jesus, I love you. I love you. And I have to admit to him, the Bible tells us this, the only reason we love him is because we first, he first loved us. That's a selfish, self-centered love. I only love him because he first loved me, and he knows that. So oftentimes I say, Lord, I want you to know I love you, and I know it's a selfish love, and I love you only because you first loved me, but I want you to know I love you. I love you, Lord Jesus. I love you, Heavenly Father. I love you, Holy Spirit. I don't even understand how you can be three in one. I don't understand a lot about you, but I want you to know that I love you. And I tell him that daily. He's waiting to hear that from you every day before you pray I think I think that just prepares our heart for prayer every day every day you should bow before him every day you should thank him every day you should praise him every day you should confess your sin to him every day you should tell him I love him I love you then every day you should begin to pray you say wasn't that prayer no that's not prayer that's thanking him that's praising him that's confessing that's worshiping him and now you're prepared to pray first thing i pray every day is now father i pray that you'll fill me with your holy spirit and you'll control me i pray you'll control my tongue i have a little circle in my prayer diary that i have 
And I, I, in that prayer diary, it says, Lord, help me to praise and thank and glorify and honor and bless. Help me not to complain or grumble or backbite or judge or blaspheme. I ask God to control my tongue that I might honor him and not hurt his testimony. So once we've done those things, now we're prepared to pray. By the way, I've taken about 15 minutes to explain that. It'll take you about three minutes to do that. We're not talking about a long time, but it's something we ought to do every single day. Now when you do that, now, now <clears throat> Jesus said, Jesus said, when you pray, say, our Father. Now I want you to understand this. The people refer to this next couple of verses as the Lord's Prayer. This is not the Lord's Prayer. This is the Lord's Prayer list. This is him giving a list of things that we ought to pray for. Years ago, one of my mentors, a man named Sumner Wimp, said this. He said, Dave, uh, if you don't have a prayer list, you will not have a prayer life. That God has given us a list of things that, we'll, that we need to pray for. If you don't have a list, then you're not going to pray. If you go, you have that place set aside and that time set aside, and you just walk in there and you say, oh, now what am I going to pray about? No, you make a list of things that are important to you and you pray for those things that are important to you. But look at what Jesus said we ought to pray for. He said, pray our Father. I love this. I love this. Now grab a hold of this. There's so much. I'm only going to give you a couple points from this. But he said, pray our Father. There's two great truths that are in that statement. Our Father. When you got saved, you became a member of the family of God. When you are praying this prayer, you are as an individual praying to the God that is all of ours, our fathers. He is our father. He's not just your father. He's not just my father. He's our father. And God wants us to pray for all of our brothers and sisters around the world. We should be praying individually for the collective we should be praying these things for all of us you'll note in in the prayer he says give us this day our daily bread forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us lead us not into temptation deliver us from the evil one this is us praying this is us as individuals praying for us collectively why? Because of what God wants to do. This is so amazing. That's number one, our Father. Second thing, I want you to see this. I was praying one day. I was down on my knees. In fact, I was outside in my garage because our house was filled with guests. So I had to have a place to pray one morning, and it was outside in my garage next to my treadmill. I have a treadmill in my house that I use every single day. My treadmill. I hang clothes on it. I pile stuff on it. It's there. And so I was right next to my treadmill with all the stuff piled on it. And I was, I was kneeling down and I was praying. And I was just talking to the Lord. And I said, Lord, you know, I have a hard time. I really have a hard time understanding you. you I, I'm, I'm praying and thanking you, Father, for sending your son. But, Father, I know that you are one with the son. Because Jesus said, when I see him, I see the Father. And so I don't know how all this works. And as I was talking to the Lord, this thought came to my mind. Who said, pray, our Father? And I thought, well, Lord Jesus, you said pray our Father. And then the thought came to my mind again. Who said pray our Father? And I thought, well, Lord Jesus, you said pray our Father. And then the thought came to my mind, who? And I thought, wow. It was Jesus who said pray our Father. When I'm going to the Father, Jesus is going with me. I'm not going myself. I am going with my brother, Jesus, to our Father. He said, when you go, I'm going with you. <laughs> Man, I get to go to the Father with his only begotten Son. He goes with me. And then I'm praying for my brothers and sisters when I do that. Now, when you pray, pray our Father who art in heaven. That recognizes that he's in control of it all. He is our Father. He's in heaven. 
Then he said, pray these things. And I'm just going to give you a couple of these. He said, pray that your holy name will be manifest. Hallowed be thy name. That's not a statement, that's a request. Because prayer is asking. God, let your holy name be manifest in, your, in, in this world, in my life, in my family, in my church, in, in the churches across this country, in Christians around this world. Let your holy name be manifest. Now listen, then he prays, let your kingdom come. That is, let the manifestation of your kingdom be seen through my life and through your brothers. Listen, imagine if every one of us would pray this on a daily basis and mean it, that we're not just rattling it off like some Catholic prayer. You understand? We're meaning these things because Jesus said, when you pray, this is, by the way, he didn't say pray something like this. He said, when you pray, say these words. You check it out. Say, Father, our Father in heart, who's in heaven, let your holy name be manifest in my life. Let your holy name be manifest through your children worldwide. Because we're praying to our Father, so let your holy name be manifest through your children worldwide. Let your kingdom come through us. Let your will be done now, right now, here in this earth, just like it's done in heaven. Manifest your kingdom through us do your will through us here in this earth just like it's done in heaven that's us living with purpose understanding who we are why we're here and saying lord let it happen through us every day and you say well how's that going to happen then he says pray give us everything we need give us this day our daily needs give us what we need to be able to do your will Man, I love that. He says, we, you, you, our purpose is to, to, to do your will. Let your will, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Let your holy name be manifest in us, in this earth just like it's done in heaven. Give us everything we need to do your will. Then he said, pray, forgive us our sins as we forgive those that sin against us. Oh, we have to have that heart of forgiveness. Now, our sins judicially have been forgiven at calvary but day by day practically we we blow it and uh and and so he says confess just forgive us our sins and tell god i'm forgiving all those that have sinned against me S forgiveness i said this this morning is a perpetual day by day thing you're living with people who perpetually day by day offend you and you have to perpetually day by day forgive them Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. I love this. He says, pray, lead us not into trials. I love that. I don't, if you love trials, raise your hand. Not a, somebody raised their hand, but I don't think he knew what I was saying. Um, if you love trials, there's a little bit of problem. I don't like pain. I do not like, I'll go a long way to avoid pain. I had, uh, I had uh, kidney stones one time. These are terrible things. Doctors, the doctor said that this is like a woman having labor pains or worse. I said, if that's true, men, and men had to have labor pains, there would never be another baby born. You women are absolutely amazing. So he's, I'm laying in bed. I don't know what the problem is. I'm just in great pain. I call my son, who's our associate pastor, and our other associate pastor. I said, would you come over here and you pray for me? anoint me with oil because james says if there's any sick among you i'm not pentecostal like pentabaptist maybe but i i said uh, i said would you come over here and anoint me with oil so they came over they anointed me with oil and my son put his hands on me and he said father or, or, talk, not talking to me but talking to god father i pray for my dad i pray father that you'd give him grace to bear the pain i said no don't pray that i don't want grace to bear pain I want the pain to go away. Don't pray that I'll be able to endure. I don't want to endure. I want the pain to go away. Jesus said here, you can pray, lead us not into trials. Keep us away from, I can pray, Lord, lead me not into trials. Do you think, don't you think you can learn from trials? Yes, but there's a lot of other ways to learn. 
And I'm saying, if Jesus said, I can pray, lead me not into trials, I'm going to pray it. And I pray every day, Lord, lead us not into temptation. That means lead me not into trials. In other words, lead me in such a way that I'm doing the things that will avoid the trials and give me a clear path to you. Lead me not into trials. Deliver me from satanic attack. Can I tell you what? Not deliver me, deliver us. Can I tell you this? That there's not a single person in this room that Satan doesn't hate. Satan is fighting against you. Satan is fighting against your wife. Satan wants your wife to think you're the bad guy, and he wants you to think your wife's the bad guy. You need to understand that. Satan does all sorts of terrible things to get us fighting with each other. And, and listen, listen, we need to pray, deliver us from the evil one. The word evil there means the evil one. It's in the masculine, and it's talking about Satan. So deliver us from satanic attack. Oh, we need to pray this thing every single day. We need to pray. Now, there's so much more to say, but it'll have to wait till I'm invited back. I'm waiting for the invitation. And <clears throat> because there's so much more to say here about prayer. But I'm telling you this. You need to have a place. You need to have a where, a when. You need to pray out loud. You need to ask God. And you need to surrender yourself to God. And when you do, I want you to understand, you pray this way daily. God will work. God will manifest his kingdom. Listen, God is waiting. God is waiting for his people to begin praying what Jesus said to pray. And when we pray, we will see the manifestation of his kingdom. We'll see his will being done. We'll see God doing wonderful works through our lives. But first, we've got to submit and say, God, I'll pray the way you said to pray. Let's bow our heads for prayer, Pastor. Uh, let's pray together. Father, we we come before you now. Our hearts have been touched by your word through the man of God that has brought us into your presence, to your truth. I pray that each one of us, my heart included, that we have been challenged to pray more consistently, fervently, with love and thanksgiving and praise, that we might experience God. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed as the pianist begins to play this invitation song. I invite you, Christian, I invite you to experience God in 2021. Experience God for the rest of your life by taking this powerful message, these truths, these points, these helps from the lips of the Lord Jesus to make it part of your daily life. Would you make that promise to God tonight, that vow tonight, that you will begin you'll begin to be able to have this time with God. And though you might stumble and fall and fail, you get back up and say, I want to walk with God. I want to experience God. I am complete in Christ, but I want to walk in this love relationship with him. Heads about, eyes are closed. If you're here tonight and you're not sure that heaven is your home, I pray now for those who may not know Christ to come to Jesus. Heads about, eyes are closed. Would you raise your hand? You'd say, Pastor, I need to be saved tonight. Would you simply raise your hand if you're not sure that heaven is your home? I'd like to be able to invite you to receive Christ as your Savior. Anyone at all, anyone at all, I want to receive Jesus as my Savior. Would you pray with me right there where you're seated? From your heart, dear Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. I believe Jesus died for me and rose again. Please come into my heart and become my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Father, thank you for the great day it's been. We praise you for being our God, our Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Brother Lula Poor is going to come at this time.